Um, welcome to everybody on this Friday afternoon. It's beautiful here in Washington, D.C. I hope it is there wherever you are. Um, we welcome you on behalf of ACES Connection, and now we have over 43,000 members around the country and around the world, and the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, also known as CTIP. Uh, CTIP advocates for public policies and programs at the federal, state, tribal, and local levels that incorporate trauma-informed ACES science-based solutions to solve social, economic, and health challenges. ACES Connection is a social network devoted to growing trauma and resilience movement and supporting communities in using ACES science to implement solutions, not solve problems now, but implement uh, solutions. I'm Elizabeth Pruitt. I'm the policy analyst for ACES Connection. And I'm joined today by Dan Press, Jesse Kohler, and uh, Marlo Nash, who are leading CTIP's uh, trauma campaign. We are fortunate to have Allison Sabula who to facilitate this conversation. She's been playing this role in uh, all of ACES Connections uh, Better Normal series, which this is part of. This is uh, a series that is really devoted to a range of topics so that when we come out of the pandemic, we're, we're looking at something that um, opens doors for innovation and new ways of looking at things. If this um, pandemic has done nothing else, it certainly put the spotlight on so many of the problems that our systems have, particularly the uh, inequalities, uh, both economic and, uh, and racial. Um, the Better Normal series has covered every imaginable topic from racial and health disparities to trauma-informed education practices, housing, and many more. We've had leaders uh, that are well known in the field like Bezel van der Kolk, but we've also had very many of the wonderful people out in the field that are doing this work and, and doing innovative things that we are all learning from. You can look at all of the um, prior episodes. There are about uh, 18 now, I believe, and they're all uh, available on the uh, ACES Connection webpage under the, uh, the webinar widget, uh, which is pretty prominent on the, on the homepage. You'll be hearing from Dan and Jesse about CTIP's National Trauma Campaign to educate Congress about trauma science uh, through the recruitment of uh, volunteers in each congressional district. Um, it's a, a lofty goal, but it's an important goal, and all of you have a role to play. They will offer you ways as an individual and also in your role with whatever organization you're involved with uh, in, in influencing federal decision makers right now and going into the future. Marlo Nash will des describe how federal funds that are flowing to the states can be used to support schools and other systems to become trauma-informed and resilience building in the face of the pandemic. What you learn today will equip you to advocate for policies to create a better normal. This is really our moment. Never before has there been such a catastrophic development that reveals the flaws in our system and the inequities in our society that impact every single person in our country. The pandemic is a collective traumatic event that opens the way, I believe, and many do, uh, for a fresh approach to solving problems that existed before the pandemic and now have been exacerbated by it. Um, as we meet this afternoon, the Democrats are considering a, another stimulus proposal uh, in the trillions of dollars and uh, the proposal that's now on the table, and it is the Democratic proposal, so it's, it's in the very early stages of being considered. Uh, has um, almost a trillion dollars for states and localities and tribes. Uh, the Republicans have, have said that they're very uncomfortable with this level of spending, uh, but the White House has indicated that um, it is uh, open to some kind of compromise. So we're really uh, in the middle of both implementing what has 
uh, already been passed and looking ahead to what opportunities there might be uh, in the future. After a couple of short uh, introductions, which I'm getting ready to do, um, I'll turn it over to Dan and Jesse and Marlo for their presentations, and then uh, we can have uh, lots of time for questions and comments from you. Dan Press is legal advisor and a campaign core team member for CTIP. He's a partner in the law firm of uh, Van Ness Feldman, and he has spent numerous decades working on behalf of Native American tribes, as well as leading his firm's uh, pro bono program. He is really CTIP's uh, major congressional and uh, grassroots activity lead. Jesse Kohler just accepted a new position for advocacy in Washington, DC, and the organization is the Council for Strong America. Prior to that, he did an internship in the office of the Pennsylvania Attorney General, and he's been very active in the Pennsylvania Trauma-Informed Care Network formation. This is uh, one of the uh, 25 states that have sites on ACES Connection and are doing great work at the state level. Marlo Nash will present on the opportunities in the CARES Act and future COVID funding uh, that Congress is now considering. She's the National Director of, the Partner, Director of Partnerships and Policies for St. Francis Ministries, which is headquartered in uh, Kansas and has uh, family and service providers in uh, numerous states, uh, mostly in the Midwest, I would say. Marlo um, is also a member of the campaign uh, core team. She's held senior positions in public policy and mobilization, including the Alliance for Strong Families and Communities. But her roots are in the state level where she spent 10 years with the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy prior to coming to Washington. So with those introductions and, and a little bit of context of what we're trying to accomplish today, I'd like um, to turn it over, I think, to Jesse first. I am just going to start with the PowerPoint, but I will pass it back over to Dan, I believe, to do the initial introductions as our forefather of the campaign and CTIP, and then I will take over from there. Unmute yourself, Dan. Oh, Dan. Oops. Uh, oh, can you hear me? I'm unmuted. Yeah, we can. Yeah, okay. We can. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, ACES Connection, uh, Elizabeth Allison, for allowing us to join you on your Better Normal. Uh, as I'll get into, we've developed a wonderful working relationship with ACES Connection and look forward to it developing more and more. Uh, I was also just pleased to see the many different parts of the country. Uh, all of the participants are from, uh, we really cover places that uh, we haven't had that much contact with before, and so we're glad you're here, and we hope after you listen to Jesse talk about the campaign, you'll sign up and uh, provide representation from your part of the country uh, to our campaign to educate Congress. Uh, CTIP, Campaign Trauma Informed Policy and Practice, uh, as its name implies, works in two spaces. Uh, First, we work to promote networking among uh, trauma-informed coalitions around the country. Uh, one of the initiatives we've just launched with ACES Connection is to bring together the statewide coordinators in different regions to have an opportunity to learn about what's going on in Washington, but also an opportunity to just share with each other their, their successes, their struggles, uh, we've had two meetings so far, uh, one for the Northeast states and one for the Midwest states, but we're very quickly planning one, I guess it's next week actually, for the West and the Southeast. And I think we're short knowing somebody from New Mexico. I saw Albuquerque pop up. If you could let us know if you're part of a statewide coordinating entity, we'd, we'd love to involve you on in that. So we're trying to um, promote networking uh, over the last couple of months, I've had the opportunity to talk to 
really hundreds of people around the country engaged in trauma-informed work, and it is so exciting. There is so much going on all over the country, at the local level, at the state level, unfortunately not so much at the federal level, but th this is an issue that I think is finally blossoming, and uh, we're glad that all of you are part of it and you're joining us today. Uh, CTIP's second focus is on policy, on persuading the United States Congress to incorporate trauma-informed concepts into all their legislation. There was a recent World Health Organization study that found that ACEs cost the United States eight, no, $740 billion a year uh, in healthcare costs dealing with the results of ACEs. We spent almost nothing on preventing ACEs. And the mission for uh, CTIP is to change that. So our overall goal is to make America trauma-informed and we're trying every way we can, but it's really the folks like you out in the field who bring so much passion uh, to the work you're doing that is gonna, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's what happens when you sit outside. Uh, who are going to make it possible. So I'd like to turn it over to Jesse, who will talk about our campaign to educate Congress. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. And you mind muting? Thank you. Uh, so like Dan said, we need on the National Trauma Campaign, everybody who is on this webinar and many others to use your voice as constituents in legislative districts to advocate for the comprehensive trauma-informed legislation that we are working toward at the federal level. The goal of the campaign is to coordinate and organize networks of volunteers in all 435 legislative districts to advocate for this legislation. And when we're able to develop these lines of communication to congressional offices from constituents, we will gain power, gain momentum, as you can see on the screen below, the initial goals for the National Trauma Campaign when we launched in February were for year one to really be focused on just educating Congress and advocating for them to join the House Trauma-Informed Care Caucus. Obviously in March, April, and now May, the coronavirus pandemic has forced us to pivot, which is what my colleague Marlo is going to talk more about. Um, and, and we focused more on impacting the CARES Act legislation because Congress is not really worried about joining uh, caucuses right now. They're pretty much solely focused on dealing with the coronavirus pandemic as it sits. But we haven't lost sight of where we're going. The coronavirus has been, like Elizabeth mentioned, and we don't wanna say that it's an opportunity, but it's been a, a way for people to see what uh, toxic stress, what extreme adversity can do. And it's been a window to discuss the impact that trauma-informed care and building resilience can have throughout communities across America. Moving forward, as we build out this network, as we develop lines of communication with congressional members, we are going to start to advocate for a legislative vision that that works toward a comprehensive trauma-informed America, like Dan said. So that's more or less exactly what's on this slide. Uh, we really need for people on this webinar and across the country to join the National Trauma Campaign, which I'll show you how to do in a second. And in addition to joining and advocating with your own congressperson, there is strength, there is strength in numbers in this campaign. So if you are able to leverage your own network, discuss with your own colleagues and peers and get them involved, that magnifies the efforts, that magnifies the advocacy role that we take in this campaign, that you all take in this campaign, and makes our message that much stronger. Like Dan said, the annual health care cost attributable to ACEs in 2017 was $748 billion. To put that in context, the entire Department of Defense budget this year was $738 billion. So this is a massive number and we don't spend nearly enough money on the prevention side. And that is forcing us to spend more and more on the back end, which is just driving us deeper into debt. 
So the goal is that if we can begin to advocate on the federal level and get some money appropriated for trauma-informed and resilience-focused activities in communities, we can start to save funds and then those funds that are saved can then drop down to states and further perpetuate the trauma-informed programs that we're advocating for. So I'm going to hop off that page and share, um, hop on the internet real quick to show you how you can join the campaign. So if you go to ctip.org, you will find a tab for the National Trauma Campaign, which is where you'll be able to sign up and where you'll be able to find a number of resources to be able to help you as you advocate, as you share information about the campaign. So we're gonna to wanna to go to ctip.org, which is ctipp.org. And this national, this national trauma button is where we're gonna to wanna to go to sign up for the campaign and find all of the toolkits, all of the information that Marlo is going to share with you and that we can discuss and try and influence Congress as we move forward. Jesse, whatever screen you're sharing, it's not the CTIP page. Oh. Yeah, you're showing a personal email. <laughs> My apologies. My for apologies. For <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. Thank you for letting me know, know how my email works. Did that, is that better? Fantastic. It's, it's my like sincere your, apologies. It's a weird Zoom thing that you have to stop sharing and then share again when you want this screen to switch. Yeah. It's so difficult. Usually people assume that as a 26 year old, I would know technology. I'm still figuring it all out. I think we all are. It's all good. So this join the campaign section is really what Dan and I were just talking about. It just gives some background and overview to the campaign. This take action section are the various toolkits that we're going to use moving forward. These will continue to grow. The House Trauma Caucus Ask Toolkit, that was the original toolkit that was the phase one plan for this campaign. The toolkit to grow the campaign allows for you to leverage your networks to help us expand the campaign throughout the country so that way we can have at least one, if not multiple, liaisons and organizations in all of the 435 congressional districts across the country. And this COVID-19 toolkit is where we've pivoted to try and influence CARES Act dollars, HEROES Act dollars, and continue to influence COVID legislation to promote trauma-informed care and a trauma-sensitive response to the current pandemic. This next section of constituent engagement is where I'll really direct your attention to be able to sign up and join the campaign today. It's awesome to see how many people from all over the country are on this webinar, and that provides a lot of power to, to increase the reach of our network and reach more Congress people. So I'll really invite people to join as a local liaison at this link here. It's a simple Google form. Local liaisons will receive calls to action, develop communication, lines of communication with their Congress people and their staff, and they will just sort of bounce back and forth and talk to their Congress people, let the campaign know how the conversations went, and it'll be a process that continues as we work toward comprehensive legislation. We also invite anybody that's a part of an organization to sign up because organizations have certain network powers and other abilities to leverage um, as constituents, but also leverage their own networks to again, help us grow the campaign. And then the last thing that I'll show you are just the various resources that we have available for you all as liaisons or just as people interested in trauma-informed care to be able to help you as we move forward in the coronavirus pandemic, as well as just developing trauma-informed systems throughout the country. So that's my spiel. Oh, the last thing is that we have a number of really solid infographics that we invite you to use. Um, that can really help to be part of your messaging as you talk to Congress or others about the power of trauma-informed care. So with that, I will turn it over to Marlo Nash. Marlo share Nash, my share my, my personal email, but instead to the PowerPoint. And so Marlo, it is all yours. Thank you, Jesse. And I, I am 
I'm also delighted to be here with you all. I see a few people who have been on some earlier webinars and I'm delighted that you are back with us and I would encourage you and, and everyone else to really think about questions you have, even if they are technical questions. Um, we'll try to leave time today to be able to really help you uh, make this information today actionable, whether it's join the campaign or get involved in the federal um, processes that we're going to talk about. Um, as uh, Elizabeth said, I'm with St. Francis Ministries and we're a national and international organization um, headquartered in Kansas, as Elizabeth said, and in Nebraska, Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, uh, providing direct services largely in partnership with the child welfare systems. And it's that work that we do that's up close with families that inspires our national advocacy work and what brings me to the National Trauma Campaign Core Team. Um, my, this next section of the webinar is um, to describe to you uh, the federal funding that was in the CARES Act, which really a package of bills now that, ha that Congress has passed. Um, and my, I want to start by just saying the main takeaway from this section, and it is going to be true um, for a little bit of time in our country, is that flexible federal dollars are coming to the state in very large amounts. And when that happens, the, there are decision makers at the state level who suddenly have to make lots of decisions about how to direct that funding. And it is an environment where when somebody comes in and makes a compelling case for where some of those funds should be directed, there is a likelihood of uh, getting some of the funds directed um, as, as advised or as requested. So we wanted to talk to you about this because we really believe there is plenty ample science about trauma and its effects. There's ample research about how um, after disaster, during and after disasters, there are uh, overwhelmingly stressful experiences that cause trauma and we know that trauma can have lifelong effects. So we wanna walk you through what is already uh, money that's already likely come to your states from, from the federal government and, and how it might be directed. Uh, and then later in the presentation, we'll talk to you about the next um, process the Congress is going through and, and what we might expect in the next um, uh, COVID response legislation from the Congress. So what we know now, of course, is that the pandemic is affecting physical, mental, and economic health and nearly every public system. And that so far Congress has passed a package of four laws in response to the COVID pandemic. And now they're discussing another bill. Um, and I wanna just put a financial kind of perspective on this conversation because another reason it's so important for you to think about how you can elevate and advance um, the effort to make systems trauma-informed at this time uh, is because the amount of money that's going from the federal government into COVID response is going to change the landscape for federal funding um, for probably a decade, if not longer. Um, so this, these next few points, you don't really have to commit them to memory. Just, it's just to leave the impression of how the magnitude that we're talking about. So the four new laws are valued at more than $2 trillion. It's the largest stimulus package since the 1930s, which when what we know as the New Deal, deal was passed. Um, last year, all of federal revenue, so all of federal income was $3.5 trillion. The US spent $4.4 trillion. So last year, pre-pandemic, on typical spending, we already went about a trillion dollars over budget. Um, the first round of COVID response spending is already half of what was spent on all federal expenditures last year pre-pandemic. And we know that, as I mentioned a moment ago, Congress is right now, literally right now, talking about uh, the next uh, piece of COVID legislation. And we know that there is going to be continued need even beyond the next package and into the future. So the costs are, um, are enormous and outsizing our income as a country um, already, and that's just gonna grow. So your voice is really needed um, to step into this process um, because we know how great the mental health needs are, how 
tremendous the need is to have a trauma-informed response. And we know that these flexible resources are available and flexible now, but that's not going to be how things will be forevermore. There's a, at a point things will shift and they'll be very scarce, very um, uh, specifically targeted resources, and it will be a different landscape. So if you could advance to the next slide, Jesse. Oh, my slide didn't move. Did you move it? Oh, it never mind. It did. Sorry. I think there was just a little bit of delay. Okay. So what we know about the laws that have already passed is there was nothing explicitly directed toward trauma-informed approaches. Mental health is referenced, but the frame in these the laws that have already passed is frequently treatment and counseling which leaves out, as you know, the public health approach of having trauma-informed systems as part of a full continuum that is needed to address the overwhelming stress and the mental health needs. But because mental health is contemplated in some of the language in the laws, there's, a, there's an opening to direct resources toward trauma-informed approaches. And primarily uh, this opportunity or this opening is in the Education Stabilization Fund, which I will talk a little bit more about in a moment. In the laws, the issue that caused trauma or result from traumatic experience, uh, experiences received relatively small allocations. So a little bit of money was put toward family violence, child welfare, substance use, and suicide prevention, but in no way was it enough funding to tackle what we know is happening uh, in those areas and more that are stressors and affect mental health. Um, and there is no requirement for coordination of funds within the states. Um, this is very flexible funding, which um, is what makes it interesting to think about stepping into. So the Education Stabilization Fund is probably the one that um, I would lift up to you as the most obvious one for you to be working in uh, as an advocate. The money has most likely gone to the states because at the federal level, they made it very easy for states to draw down this funding. They tried to eliminate red tape and processes as much as they could. The Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund is the smallest amount of money out of the, the total fund, which you can see there is a, the total fund is 30.75 billion. The Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund is 3 billion, so spread across all of the states, but it's also the most flexible pot of money. So it's essentially saying to governors, um, you know, use this money the way you need to in your state to address the needs um, of your education systems and your students and your parents and your educators. Um, in that list of allowable expenditures, it references mental health supports. In the er elementary and secondary school emergency fund, um, it's also uh, got a wide breadth of um, items that are permitted to put the funds toward, and it also mentions that one of the allowable experience uh, um, expenditures is on social and emotional supports. Um, to a lesser degree, the higher education uh, fund in this package um, is uh, it, it does the, in that section of the law. It does not specifically mention trauma informed. However, in the governor's emergency education relief fund that that broad bucket of you could spend this on mental health support includes higher education so if you are connected to universities and really um you know uh thinking about that population it would be to talk to to speak to the governor about using some of that governor's um fund to address uh to make uh universities and campuses trauma informed um, we, I also want to say that just today, and we, will send, we can send it out to you, but we've created a tool specifically for the Education Stabilization Fund that, that captures this background, this overview, some of the details about it, and also lists some example ideas of things that school districts could fund. And it talks a little bit about who are the decision makers and how would you go about um, activating in your state to bring this to the attention of decision makers and request that they direct some of those funds to trauma-informed responses. Now I'm just going to quickly touch on these next few um, block grants. Um, the community services block grant is another one that, um, it, it, that 
that you could, um, if you are connected to your community action agencies or have that relationship, you could have a discussion with them about directing some, some of the resources to become trauma-informed. Some community action agencies may already deliver all of their programs as trauma-informed programs, um, but it is something you could um, visit with them and ask about. And the, the language, that their fund is fairly flexible and I think a case could be made, but you would have to work with them to make that case. Same with community development block grant. There's nothing in there that requires them to spend money on having a trauma-informed approach. However, there's language in there that says they need to essentially do what they can to help unemployed workers get back into the workforce. And as you all know, when someone has experienced trauma, addressing their trauma is one of the things that can prepare them to go back to the workforce. So again, it, it would be a case to make, um, but it, it is, uh, it's another pot of money that if you have a relationship or want to reach out to the decision makers for your community development block grant, you could reach out and begin to make that case. The child care development block grant is another one that I will just say I wish um, talked about addressing social emotional uh, needs for our young children. Uh, the way it is positioned in these laws that have passed, it's really seen as more of an economic development need. It's, it's the, the concern in Congress about childcare right now is uh, having people, essential workers still be able to work and have children still be safe. Um, but it is another system that I'm sure you are aware needs to be trauma informed. And so on all, each of these three, I would just encourage if you want to start the conversation, um, this is a good starting point and, um, and at least you've got your foot in the door and starting to, to get, make them aware of the need for trauma-informed responses. Okay, next slide. So the timing is right now um, for this current uh, pot of federal money. As I said, in most states, it's probably already in your state. Um, an interesting new piece that came up this last week that I saw is that you know, there are some states that have very few COVID cases and some, but they are still getting large amounts of money because uh, it's all going out on formula and Congress does that to get money out the door as quickly as possible. But in those states that have fewer um, needs because the, the, the pandemic is not as prevalent, there may be even more of an opportunity actually to, to uh, direct funds. Um, so you need to prepare ideas and strategies and a good again for the education stabilization stabilization fund That's what our new tool is intended to help you do But you certainly are experts in this area and I'm and can and prepare the ideas and strategies that you think will really work in your state or or in your local school district or your community in the case of some of those other block grant funds. Um, and then you need to reach out to influencers and decision makers and make the case for them about why having trauma-informed systems and approaches is so important uh, in light of the COVID pandemic and how far-reaching its impact has been. Um, we have a whole, in addition to the tool, the new tool that came out today, we have a whole resource guide for um, to support your work in this area. And I'm gonna now, uh, turn it to Dan for a moment. Jesse, could you pop back to that last slide? Turn it to Dan for a moment for a bit of a transition. Thank you, Marlo. Um, I think all of you have probably been spending months, if not years, trying to get your communities to implement trauma-informed programs, whether it's the schools or in the social programs or in law enforcement. Um, what's happened over the last two months doesn't change that, it adds to it. It adds two important elements to it. One, it provides resources that have always been lacking. And secondly, it provides a new compelling reason to implement trauma-informed programs now. Uh, as Barlow indicated, the evidence is clear that when uh, you come out of a disaster like this one, uh, the level of stress goes way up and you see a, a surge in uh, kids acting out in school, a surge in child abuse, a church surge in domestic violence. Uh, some of those you're already seeing now. So uh, over the last couple of months, we lear hopefully learned an important lesson. When you're told there's going to have a disaster coming and the red flags are up all over the place and you fail to take advantage of that information, you end up where we are now having a much greater crisis, spending a lot more money and suffering many more health problems and social problems because we didn't take the warnings about COVID 
early on, seriously enough. Now we know the same kind of warnings are out there if uh, that following the pandemic, there's going to be a huge surge in trauma-informed behavior. And if we don't take action now to prepare for that surge, it's going to hit us and it's going to be much more devastating because we won't have the elements in place to deal with it. And that includes things like having your schools trained to, to deal with trauma in, in their students, basically making your schools trauma-informed, uh, helping your teachers and uh, counselors and others uh, learn how to deal with secondary trauma because when that trauma comes into the classroom, uh, it's not only going to cause problems for the kids, but the faculty is also going to face a real, real threat of secondary trauma. So those are the kinds of programs that need to be put in place now uh, so that when school reopens, however it reopens, uh, you're prepared. Uh, we've given you a couple of tools. One is uh, for the $3 billion uh, fund from the governor, the GEAR, uh, Governor Education uh, Emergency Relief Act. Uh, we actually have a draft letter that I think has been sent out, right, Josie, in the packet. And it's a letter to your governor who has, as Marlo indicated, such broad discretion on how to use their share of the $3 billion. Uh, urging the governor to use a portion of that money to implement trauma-informed programs in the schools. And ideally, you have an organization that could send that in. If not, uh, just have individuals send it in, but get it on the, the governor's team, the school super, the superintendent of schools of the state, get it on their radar screen. And the same is true for your local educational agency. Uh, reach out to them. We don't have a specific level uh, letter for that one, but those are local or easier to access. Reach out to them and tell them to use their share of that $14 billion to uh, prepare for the next epidemic, the trauma epidemic that's going to be hitting you uh, all over your communities in, in the coming months. So, oops. So, Marlo, you want to take it back? Sure. Thanks, Dan. And sure. I, thanks, Dan. And I. Oh, can you mute? Thanks. Um, I put a couple of links in the chat. One of them is the link to the new tool that I was telling you that we just uh, are rolling out today. And the second, um, I'm sorry, that was the second. The first link is the state by state allocations from the gear fund. And the, the last thing I'll say before transitioning to the next part of the session is that um, as you can imagine, there are many, many demands on these education funds. Um, there are all kinds of things that, that they are allowed, school systems are allowed to spend the money on, um, and they, they will have no problem spending it all. Um, so it's, it truly is an advocacy effort needed on your part to help folks understand the science, help folks understand the trauma that is occurring right now. Stories of what you're hearing will be very compelling um, of what you're hearing is actually happening with families right now and students um, that it, it's not like this is a cakewalk, right? It's not like this is this, this, just show up and ask them and they'll do it. Um, but you are the people who can really make that compelling case. And, and if you don't do it, there aren't others who are going to do it. So you're very needed. Um, so to, to look ahead, so we're taking a, a a very specific break now because we we have just spent the last few minutes talking about legislation that has already passed and federal money that is already flowing to states. Now we're going to talk about what is act, what is happening in Congress now and what might be opportunities going forward. So now we're appealing to you as advocates to engage through the campaign in this federal advocacy to try to and continue to have resources that flow either directly to trauma-informed activities or again at least mention mental health social emotional supports as allowable activities so that you can then advocate for um, trauma-informed approaches in your states so there are two major calls to action and one of them is that you engage with your congressional offices in anticipation of the next federal COVID package, and I will update you on that in a moment. 
And the second one, as Jesse emphasized at the beginning of this call, we really need your help growing the reach of the National Trauma Campaign because of its distinct focus on engaging congressional offices they we very much need every single office to have at least one person who's very knowledgeable and passionate on the science and the opportunity um, to build resilience and address and prevent and address trauma and you are those people and the people in your network are those people so we very much need you so jesse if you'll go to the next slide what i'll do now is talk to you a little bit about what we mean by engaging with your congressional members so what we want to ask you to do is call the main office for your the members of your congressional delegation and every individual has one U.S. representative for your district and two U.S. senators. So call and ask them who is the staff person who works on trauma related um, issues or you may need to ask for who works on child and family issues or healthcare issues because if they've never given a thought to working on trauma issues they may not tell, be able to tell you who that staff person is. So you might have to use several different kinds of uh, terms to get to the right person, but it's an easy call. You'll talk to a receptionist. They'll give you the name to, of a staff person. Very low, very low threshold, um, very easy. Then you ca can use our information and tools. We have lots of things on the website to help you with this. Um, to reach out to that staff person, introduce yourself and your work, whether that means your professional work or your, the work of your coalition, if you're part of a trauma coalition locally, and let them know you can be a go-to resource for um, addressing the effects of trauma, particularly right now, the impact of COVID pandemic. Um, once you've communicated with them, you can follow up, you can send materials. We have the, the, all, the, uh, all kinds of things you can select from, from our website, infographics, videos, those kinds of things you can send, and then um, remain in touch with them to serve as a resource for information and developments. So that's really what we mean when we say engage with your congressional members. That's, that's what we're talking about. And once you do that and successfully build that relationship with the staffer, um, it becomes much easier to be in regular communication with them and be their go-to person. So we have a toolkit for engaging um, with Congress around COVID, and you'll have that link when you have the, the um, PowerPoint deck. Uh, and so that now I want to talk to you a minute about what's under development. So you'll recall a few minutes ago, I said that none of the legislation that has already passed mentioned trauma informed specifically well. The National Trauma Campaign and other national partners have successfully gotten um, the, the need for trauma informed approaches elevated to Congress. So the, the House has a bill right now, if you follow the news, I'm sure you've heard of the HEROES Act. And in the HEROES Act, there are a number of trauma-specific provisions and much more acknowledgement from Congress that, we, that trauma is occurring right now and that we need um, research on it and a response to it. So we're encouraged that this next piece of legislation may look different. Now, the way that this works, as you know, probably, um, this is the House bill is a Democrat, it's considered a Democrat bill, even though a lot of the provisions, and especially the trauma provisions, are bipartisan within that bill. The overall bill um, is considered a Democrat bill, and of course, the Senate is Republican run. So we have a long way to go before we have a final bill for this next package of COVID response, and before we know what will be in it. That is why we need you so badly, because we will be um, uh, equipping the campaign with talking points, with calls to action in a timely way, with information about which members of Congress particularly need to be uh, engaged and educated. So in order to keep those trauma prevent provisions in the ultimate final next piece, Piece of federal COVID legislation, we've got to be an active advocacy effort. So we've done the work to get the um, get some provisions in there, um, but now we need your help keeping them in uh, all the way to a final signature by the president. Next slide. Uh, so I've mentioned several times that we have uh, lots of tools. We are happy to answer your questions today or after today. Um, so you'll, when you get the PowerPoint, you'll have these tools. We have a video, it's a three minute, three minute video that succinctly describes the trauma that COVID is inflicting and 
what's going on, um, what's the, the stress response that, that people are experiencing and why it's so important that we address it. We have infographics that help show how trauma-informed policies and practices are impactful. Um, and so those are available to you. And uh, we would love to take the last few minutes of the call to answer your questions. And I've been seeing some come through on the chat, so I'll look at those. But Allison or Elizabeth, if you want to uh, lift up questions or have people yeah, ask I questions. Got Thank you so much, Marlo. Um, okay, first, I would love to hear from Suzanne O'Connor. And I'm going to make it so that you can unmute yourself. Give me one second. Okay, Suzanne. You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you're still here with us. Yes, I am. Hi. Hi. Oh, did I raise my hand? Yeah, you had said a question about funding earlier. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm thinking about everything. So I, I actually forgot my question because now I'm thinking about yeah. something else. Um, but my question was around the gear funding and whether or not um, out of school time programs, that system might have access to those funds. And I know OST advocates and would it be helpful to let them know about this funding um, that's coming. Thank you so much. Marla, do you wanna? Yeah, I, I um, will, you know what, let me, let me look at it while we have, I don't, cause I don't wanna give you misinformation. I am pretty sure it, the law contemplates after school and summer programs, but let me just do a quick check while some of the other questions are raised. Okay, thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, we had a, a compliment from Sarah Shea. Are you still here? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, no, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, no, you guys are awesome. Um, the, I, I found the education tool and reviewed it after Dan mentioned it, or maybe it was Marla, I can't remember. Um, we have an interesting situation that has popped onto our radar here in Utah. So I'm in Salt Lake. Um, and our representative, Ben McAdams, is actually hosting a little town hall mental health focused meeting on Tuesday. And so Mary Beth and I have been brainstorming on how to capitalize with his undivided attention. Hopefully it will be undivided. <laughs> um, so this, all this material is really, really helpful. Thank you so, so much. I want to interrupt my search and <laughs> into the CARES Act to say, I'm so glad you mentioned um, the town hall meeting. I want to really encourage you all immediately and over the next few months when this election year, when, when candidates are unable to do uh, what they would normally do, which is a lot of public events, um, there are going to be more virtual events. And what I have found personally, as I join those virtual events, because people are not entirely accustomed to them, that they offer a tremendous opportunity to get your question in because people are shy to ask questions. And so it's different from a public forum where there's a lot of lining up and, you know, getting, getting, maybe getting called on, maybe not, because you can just put it in the chat. And um, so I have found the virtual, a lot of access um, by participating in virtual events with policymakers or, or candidates. So I re really want to encourage to think, I'm glad you mentioned it um, and that you're thinking about doing it because uh, that's going to be a great way for you all to, to raise this, these issues. Um, awesome. So, okay, let me hear from Carolyn McAllister. I see, I see you there. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. I was just curious, what I heard a lot of, which is wonderful, is treatment and, and that sort of thing, and general um, trauma, you know, addressing trauma for the workforce, but children and, you know, abused children or children, when they go back to school, uh, this abuse is going to continue, or I should say the trauma of what's happened will continue, and prevention efforts by a community are incredibly important. And so training for schools, yes, um, but training for all sectors. And, and the other question I would throw in that as a prevention piece is some sort of continuity or benchmark with that training. Because what I've struggled with here, and we've been trying, we're resilient, uh, Payne County are associated with uh, the university here in the middle of Oklahoma, but is 
the lack of consistency and, you know, very well educated individuals, their hearts are in the right place, but we've got to have common language and we've got to have benchmarks on what trauma informed really is. And even within the school system, because that's the well hanging fruit, we've had that struggle. So I'm really hoping that there could be some sort of money or, or some resources that are put towards that as a vision of, you know, becoming trauma informed America. I guess that's my question. <laughs> Is anybody aware of, of that provision possibly being in this future legislation um, that's coming up? Thanks so much. Um, Dan, do you want to take that one? Or? Um, I can't answer the benchmark issue, but you did raise another important issue. We focus mainly on schools because the money for schools is most flexible money, but the, the upcoming trauma tsunami is going to hit a lot more than the schools. And you're right, the whole community needs to be prepared for it. The police department, the social services program, uh, the courts, uh, the drug abuse programs, they all need to be prepared for it. Unfortunately, other than the community services block grant, uh, there's really no pot of money in the bill that we were able to identify that could be used to fund training for those other institutions. I don't know, Marlo, if you can think of any, uh, but you may have to just dip in on other sources of funds. And uh, Carolyn, just to mention, I, I think that, you know, one of the goals of the comprehensive trauma-informed federal legislative vision that we are creating is to do exactly what you're talking about in terms of setting those benchmarks and what it means because you know i mean if trauma-informed care is indicative or if one of the key parts of it is this common language and understanding of what trauma is then having these benchmarks is so critical and that just doesn't exist yet at least not widespread right the missouri model has put out certain benchmarks as to what that may mean but if that isn't more widely adopted then it you know, what happens in Nevada and what happens in Pennsylvania are two totally different things. We're calling it the same thing. And so as we move forward with this campaign, that's one of the things that we really want to do is develop those benchmarks, develop that common language and understanding. So that way we can move forward as a country in terms of becoming comprehensively trauma-informed. Uh, so we completely agree with what you're saying. That's a concern of ours as well. Thank you. Um, so we one just last wanna... point. one last point we um, we talk about implementing trauma informed programs uh, if you're not sure if you haven't already engaged with a particular program there are lots of them out there and ACES Connection is a great resource for finding uh, trauma informed programs uh, there are a whole variety of them and you can find the one that seems most appropriate for you so that's a plug for ACES Connection. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, we do want to be mindful of everyone's time and we're wrapping up here. Um, Marla, were you able to find anything? If not, maybe you two can connect over email. Email? I'm sorry, I just, I just don't wanna give misinformation. I, I will say, Suzanne, I would contact if you're part of a national network for after school because there's so much flexibility yeah. in these funds, it's worth, and, and I'm sure you're, if you're if you're connected to any national network that works on after school, they'll know. Yeah. Um, I've just read so many things that I'm concerned that I what I've read is you know maybe that's, not. That's you know. good advice, and I'll go to the legislation. But sometimes you know the time it takes for the advocates on the ground to know, mm -hmm. right? If this is so. This all just happened, and it's fresh. So I really appreciate that. Um, and, and the one last thing I would say is that you know it's not lost on any uh, school system that they're getting ready to release the kids to summer, and that summer is going to be very unusual with states opening and closing and all of that. And so I, I just I think it's worth talking to your local school district or your state school school system or both, mm -hmm. and raise that 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 after school and out of school time programs really need to be trauma informed and need absolutely. attention now. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Thanks. Um, okay, so I just want to welcome you all to um, um, engage with us on ACES Connection. So you can go to 
acesconnection.com and join if you're not already a member. And if you are already a member, we invite you to check out our communities by clicking the communities tab in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Um, Elizabeth had posted a couple of good communities to join. I'm like scrolling up to try and find them. Um, um, I, I will try to repost those yep, up there. Oh, I see them, I see them. Okay. Hold on. I'm gonna repost them again. Um, and we invite you to, to, um, to join these. We also invite you to um, engage with us by making, making your own posts. Many of you may be longtime members, but you've never posted anything on our website. We would love to hear from you. And the way that you do that is you just log on to our website and click the post button. And anyone who's a member can, can blog on our website, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, we are so grateful to all of you for co-creating this community with us at ACES Connection. And um, this has been such an inspiring presentation. And Elizabeth, I'll get, um, have you also do some concluding remarks. Um, I will, I actually don't normally send out an email to everyone who registered, but on this one, since it's so resource heavy, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So everyone will get an email with the resources we presented. Um, and, um, and I just want to thank everyone um, who, who presented today. We've been working a lot um, lately on getting all states on board, but this is just so crucial for making big, bigger change happen. And um, we're so grateful. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Elizabeth to, to um, bring us home. Okay. Thank you, Allison. And thanks so much to the presenters. This, this was really a great um, session filled with lots of important um, updates and uh, critical information. And going forward, um, Allison mentioned we have communities on ACES Connection and there's one that's devoted to state level uh, activity and one that's uh, devoted to um, national and that's called uh, Resilience USA. So uh, hopefully everyone will be uh, a new member if they're not already a member. And I just would like to say, you know, it's, it's such a, an unusual time, but I've found that, um, you know, that, that people do seem to be more available. And we hear from states that, you know, when they've tried to get meetings before, they, they met with, you know, more obstacles. And now um, the, the focus is on, you know, what this uh, traumatic impact is having on our country and especially on children. So there's a receptivity, I think, that didn't really uh, exist before the pandemic among uh, decision makers and elected officials. And just like everybody, many members of Congress are very um, savvy about using social media. I was sitting at my kitchen table and, and uh, got a call from a, a, a legislator, you know, he had zeroed in, you know, I'm someone that might be interested in aging issues and they had a town hall specifically on that. And uh, as Marlo said, you know, you have an opportunity to, to chime in and then follow up. So um, while it's strange that, you know, our usual way of meeting in person with legislators and in, you know, in, you know, rallies and town halls, um, doing it virtually is, you know, um, not ideal, but it's certainly an opportunity. So um, I hope everybody will, uh, you know, embrace that and uh, support the work of both ACES Connection and CTIP. And thank you so much for joining this call and staying in touch. And if you have any questions, we have our emails um, and, uh, you know, come to our website and see, see what's going on. Um, any, any of my, co-presenters want to have a final word it's a few minutes after four so thanks again for everybody joining jesse i was just going to say sign up for the national trauma campaign use your voice and have a great weekend yeah there's a thumbs up good <laughs> great thank you have a nice weekend everyone